Hello, welcome to the Everyday Outdoorsman, a podcast dedicated to the average everyday outdoors man and outdoors woman. Whether you're a veteran, hunter, or fisherman, or somebody completely new to the outdoor world, there's something here for everybody. So come on in, get comfortable, and enjoy the show. I like I like re- I like thinking about those times because they've changed so much. Oh, it was simple. We had it was so because you just deer hunted. Yeah. Uh, there was back then. I remember if you shot an eight pointer, that that was the score. Yep. You know, you counted the number of points, and and if there and was something was sticking matters. out, if you could get a ring to hang off of it, well, you know that that was a whole nother That's point. A, yep. So, uh, you know that that was your that was your talking points. You know that was, and now, um, you know, if you show somebody a picture of a deer you've harvested, the first thing out of their mouth is what it scored. Yeah. And uh, I yeah. usually tell them about 125 degrees uh, in the smoker. <laughs> <laughs> and you know I like my deer meat medium rare. That's that's how mine scores. So they all score right around one twenty five. It doesn't. <laughs> yep. Yep. They, uh, my grandpa had a a uh, a check station. He had a little store back home, and he oh, so yeah. he was a, he was a you know a, a check station. And back then, the deer uh, weight actually counted for something. Oh yeah, you know people wonder. Well, what did it weigh? Yeah, <laughs> you know because that actually how much that meat you get off people. that thing? Yeah, yeah. And, and I remember like you were talking. I remember him going out, um, you know, because he had to, you know, it took a lot of information at that time. And I remember him taking his wedding ring off and seeing if he could. Yep, there, that's a point. That you know. Oh yeah, <laughs> and going all out with it. And uh, that was when I first started and just seeing a deer. Oh yeah, and especially in my part of the the state, you know, Powell County, you're starting to get into that zone. What zone four now? Yeah, which back never then had it was a zone what seven or something. Yeah, there, there was a lot more zones back then. I remember guys coming in there and sitting down, thrilled to death that they'd seen tracks. My dad was a barber here in Frankfurt, and I can remember being up there at his barber shop and clients coming in and saying. You know, hey, Adrian, I saw deer tracks on my farm. And it that was a novelty back yep. then. Um, and then my dad would ask for permission to hunt. And they're like, well, you're crazy. You know, <laughs> we just saw the tracks, Adrian. We didn't see the deer. <laughs> but that was enough. Yeah. You know, without, without those tracks, you don't have those deer. Yeah. And we had places to hunt all over this country. And that, that's another big thing that's changed. You could knock on a door and somebody would say, yeah. Yeah, they'd look at you like you were crazy. You, you mean you want to go hunt those things? Yeah. Well, good luck finding one. You yeah. know, the last time I saw one was last Tuesday over here by the, <laughs> you know. Um, but, but you had that local farmer intel. Yep, yep. And that, that helped. But, you know, and Lord knows we didn't know. Hunters today are much more educated than than we were then we were stumbling and fumbling around the woods back then oh yeah um i didn't know what wind direction was well and the flip side of that is i learned woodsmanship i learned a lot yeah um you know nowadays you could punch anything into the youtube search bar and and hit enter and you know there's there's 150 ways to go out and tie in a peep site yeah uh, and every one of them's the recommended way to do it oh yeah if you're not doing it this way you're wrong <laughs> uh you know if you don't have this widget on your bow you know it won't work right or and it's all about marketing and sales now it's not yeah. it's not about your efficiency as a bow hunter to go out there and you know that you have to sell product yep and you know hunting shows um matter of fact uh, i have on my phone Last night, a friend of mine sent me an old Noel Feather video, oh, yeah. a link to that on YouTube. And uh, I went on there and I, I watched it, and he was talking about expandable broadheads. And he was shooting a twenty two nineteen arrow and a 70-pound bow. And one of the things that he recommended is if you shoot these mechanical broadheads, you're going to have to increase your draw weight. <laughs> Now he's shooting a you know twenty two nineteen it it's six hundred grain arrow yep 
out of a 70 pound bow. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't adequate. <laughs> and you think about that because the trend that we've gone to now is it's all about speed. Yeah. You know, if your bow's not shooting 350, 60, 70 feet a second or whatever they're at nowadays, um, they want you to run five grains per pound, which is more of a target archery setup. You know, and then you want to put an expandable broadhead on the front of it. You're shooting a real lightweight air. It's going fast. Um, and if you hit soft tissue, it's going to work. Mm-hmm. But if you hit something hard, probably not going to work. They, they work until they don't. Yeah. And that's with any broadhead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, before we get going really quick, I'm going to going to introduce everybody to you this is my my good buddy uh keith matter uh we've been talking archery and bow hunting for about the last hour and uh just decided to cut this thing on and and keep talking about it that's that's the one thing keith sure likes to do he likes to he likes to bow hunt and and talk about bow and hunting. talk about bow hunting um which which we're all about and for the last little bit we've just been talking about how much the archery game has changed. Well, the hunting game in general has. Hunting in general has changed. Um, I'm not sure that we haven't become our own worst enemies. Yeah. Um, the, it, it seems like we reached a peak and the, the bringing new people into the sport isn't happening like it used to. Um, and I think part of that has to do with people's desire to kill bigger deer. Yeah. We're, we're much better educated now than we were in the seventies because we understand more about deer habits. I don't think we'll ever fully understand them, but, uh, we do things to, to benefit our deer herds. Mm -hmm. We plant food plots and, um, we try to remove invasive plants and stuff like some of the, the bush honeysuckles and the, the autumn olives and that type stuff. And we, we do things to improve our, our opportunities, but in the process we're doing it to benefit ourselves. If we're not bringing people in to further the sport. Um, and we, we talked about this earlier, you know, back in the day you could knock on somebody's door and, Tell them that, that, you know, ask for permission to go deer hunting. Mm -hmm. And they'd kind of give you a little chuckle and tell you to go ahead, you know, because, <laughs> you know, in the last year they've seen three deer on their property. Yep. Um, nowadays people complain that they've had a horrible outing if they only see three deer from the stand. Yeah. So the deer herd is, has really grown. But uh, I think we're really, we're doing ourselves a disservice. And it, it, greed is not a good word. But that's kind of the direction that we're headed. Oh, yeah. Yeah. In, uh, in it's my, my deer. Yeah. In, in my lifetime, and uh, of course, you can go back a year or two further than that. For me, I think that late 90s, early 2000s was my golden era. I think that was for a lot of people. Um, in the 80s, the deer herd really started growing. And in the 90s, it... it that that trend definitely continued and i think the department was a little bit late reacting on relaxing some of the the zone limits and opening up opportunities um, i remember back in the day we were hunting a farm that was it was completely overrun with deer uh, they had planted 13 acres of alfalfa and did not get a cutting in a year um so that's a huge expense to the farmer, and, and yeah. his instructions to us was, go kill them all. And I said, well, there's a process that you have to go through. We can kill two deer each, and you've given myself and my friend permission to hunt on your farm, so we can kill four deer. So we can reach out to the Department of Fish and Wildlife, and um, they'll send a private lands biologist out here, and they'll give crop damage tax. And, and then Katie bar the door. <laughs> well, back then you could only kill two on crop damage tags. Oh, okay. So they issued us 12 crop damage tags, but we could only kill two. So we had eight <laughs> tags that we couldn't fill. Yeah. 
So we talked to the property owner, and he's like, well, I'm, I only gave you two permission to hunt here. I don't want a lot of people running around on my farm. Yeah. So that kind of created a little bit of a problem because we know there's a deer problem. We know that some of them need to be removed. But now you're forcing the landowner to bring people onto his property that he wouldn't normally allow on his property. And I, I get that. I fully understand it. So I went back to him again and I said, hey, you, you've got a bigger problem here than what you think than what you realize. And he said, well, I know what kind of problem I got. That's, that's money out there in that field. So, uh, he allowed me to bring people in. I could, I could bring you with me yeah, and you could harvest a deer. And then when we're done, you go home and you don't come back. Right. You don't have permission to, to hunt the farm unless I bring you. Yeah. And that, that really worked. Um, but I had talked to some of the biologists over there and said, Hey, you know, there's the opportunities there, but you're kind of limiting people. And if other landowners feel the same way and then they they increased it to four you could kill four on a crop damage tag yeah but even back then the landowner could go out there and if if the deer was creating an act of depredation then they could shoot the deer but back then they had to leave them lay yeah yeah Uh, they couldn't harvest them yeah and when of course it's different now you know when i first when i was younger and and hunting that's what farmers viewed deer as in almost every case a if nuisance. they were a tobacco farmer especially because if they walk through their plant beds and yeah if they if they poked holes in that fabric and that gas escaped then that's a huge loss for them yeah yeah and you know tobacco corn soybean you know all the all those crops deer get into them and those farmers you know were more than happy to let you go out there and, and hunt it because you were saving them money now with times being what they are and i'm not going to fault a a landowner or a farmer for this at all absolutely not now leasing land makes them more money or at least makes up for what's lost by deer so you know they they're they're uh, they're crazy not to but that makes it more difficult to get permission to hunt because somebody's got it leased yeah we, uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife used to do these town hall meetings, and Dr. Gassett was the commissioner back then. And we had gone to one over at the Alltech Arena in Georgetown. And there was an individual there that wanted to speak, and he, they let him speak. And he suggested that you open deer season up year round. Uh, he, he wanted all the deer dead. Um, he owned property in Franklin County. And that part of the county at that time, it did have a real high deer density, but he leased his farm. The people that were leasing his farm were from North Carolina. So they're only going to be up here for a short period of time and primarily gun hunt. Yeah. Well, those guys, their attitude was, I can kill does in North Carolina, but what I can't kill is quality bucks. Yeah. So they came up here and there's three of them. And they would kill their three bucks, and they would pack up their stuff, and they'd go home. Head home. So the the property owner's got a deer density problem. He's leasing his farm, and he's getting a monetary income. But he's not making as much money off the lease as he's losing the crop damage. Yep. So I approached him after this thing was over, and I said, hey, you know, I live down the road from you, and I'd be more than willing to come up there and, and get rid of some of your does for you. And he says, can't do it. I got my farm leased. And I said, well, sir, you're not fixing your problem. You're leasing your property to to some guys that are out of state. They're going to come up here and shoot three deer, and they're going to go home. So what are you going to do with all the rest of those deer? You know, that money that they're paying you, you're putting right back into your crops so you can feed them. (laughs) You're not winning this. Yep. And he he really couldn't wrap his head around it. And... you know, most farmers that I know are pretty daggone smart guys. Oh, yeah. You know, they, they know how to make money. And uh, for whatever reason, he just he had his mind made up that, that I'm leasing my farm and, and I'm I'm getting ahead. But, uh, you but, could, you but could, not really. <laughs> no, you could go out there and, and any night and you could see 50 or 60 deer out there in his soybeans. Yeah. You know, that's a lot of groceries those deer, you know, they're taking care of. So, 
you know, there's there's a fine line between leasing your property and, uh, you know, you could go to to any any old country store somewhere, and there's there's always that table in there. It's got those guys sitting around it. And if you sit in there long enough, you're going to hear the conversation of deer start up. And, you know, you'll hear one of them say, well, I sure wish all those deer go away because they are a nuisance to those guys. Yep. And then if you approach them and say, well, I sure would like to come and help you out. Well, uh... I got somebody <laughs> hunting my farm and, uh, you know, I... I donate a lot of deer every year and I, I give them to individuals. Um, I have a, a, a list of people that, that want deer and I'll go out and harvest one and I'll, I usually send out a text before I hunt. Hey, does anybody want a deer tonight? And if somebody replies, yes, if I get one, then I take it to them. And, uh, sometimes I'll help them process them there in the driveway and sometimes they'll take care of it themselves. But, um, it enables me to be able to, to remove deer from the farm and help that farmer out. Uh, one of the farms that I hunt, um, I was actually approached by the landowner and he said, Hey, do you still shoot does? Well, heck yeah, I shoot does. <laughs> I, I, I love shooting does. Um, myself and one of my friends started hunting that farm and the first year that they had corn down there, they were actually eating the stalk. I mean, that's the kind of crop damage that he had down there. And the, the, the guy that was row cropping his farm was like, Hey, if we can't get rid of this deer problem, I can't come back. Yeah. I can't make money here. So, um, we really got in there and got busy and we, we kind of knocked him in the head a little bit and, uh, took a couple of years, slowed him down and then his yields start going up. So then, you know, that the tenant farmer, he's happy and the, the landowner, he's happy. Um, and sometimes that's what it takes in these high deer density areas. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just so everybody's aware, you know, K- Kentucky where we hunt split into four different zones, the, the areas that, that Keith's talking about hunting is, is what's called zone one, which is unlimited deer or unlimited doe harvest. Unlimited antlerless yeah. harvest. Yeah. You can, you can can stack them up like cordwood if you want to. Currently in Kentucky, if you buy your deer permit, uh, it comes with four tags. You have, um, you can kill four antlerless or three antlerless and one antlered on your statewide permit. And for $15, you can get what's called an additional deer permit. And that gives you two more antlerless tags. Um, and they may have changed the language on that. Um, before you actually, um, if you didn't have an antlerless tag, bonus tag in your possession and you went out and killed two antlerless deer on your statewide permit, you technically had used your buck tag. Yeah. So I think they kind of changed that language a little bit. Um, I, I remember that because you, you'd kill that, you know, you go out and hunt, well, you shoot a doe and then you go ahead and buy your other bonus tags. So you didn't burn your buck so tag. So you didn't burn your your buck tag, yeah. Yeah. Um and, and they have changed that around now. Yeah. Um But there's there's I mean, I've been fortunate in my lifetime that you know, I I've seen this this thing evolve from the early seventies when there were no deer to you know, now we're talking about deer density problems and um but the hunter opportunity for as many deer as there are out there really isn't what it could be. Yeah. Um, you know, used to, if you showed up on somebody's doorstep and you go, Hey, me and my nine year old son, we'd like to deer hunt. And you know, that was embraced. Yeah. But, uh, it, it's getting tougher. It is. Um, if, and the, the outfitters that are coming in here, leasing up ground, um, I don't begrudge them for making a living, obviously, but, um, you know, that those, those opportunities are getting smaller and smaller with the, the leasing has become prevalent here. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it was really prevalent in Western Kentucky uh, until a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now you could, you could probably go down there and knock on any door down there, um, uh, 
I really hope they don't have an issue down there where they do stop killing deer. Yeah. And they have an overpopulation problem because that is exactly what they do not need. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, uh, we're talking about the threat of uh, the chronic wasting disease. There was a confirmed case in Tennessee just south of the Kentucky border. And the Department of Fish and Wildlife initiated a five zone or five county region down there that they're going to do uh, surveillance during the modern gun season and the muzzleloading season where you take your deer and you actually have a check station you take it to and they're going to take tissue samples of those animals and check them for the chronic wasted disease. Um, if, if people shy away from hunting in those areas down there, and the deer density does increase, and there is an outbreak of chronic wasting disease. It could be catastrophic. Yeah, yeah, and and I've all, and I know you have too. We're we're already hearing, you know, the the complaints about the inconvenience of having to take a deer to a to a check station to well, to get tested, I, which I can get, but at the same time, don't cut your nose off to spite your face. Yeah. Um. Because that's your hunting opportunities that you're potentially going to be eliminating down the road. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's not, I don't view that as a situation where you're being forced to conform. Um, I look at it more as an opportunity to do your part as a hunter. Right. Because we are the conservationists for our resources. That's what I was going to say. We, most hunters preach that to people that don't hunt. Oh, is, is our, our value to, to conservation. Now it's time to put your money where your mouth is. Yeah, it's it's time to, to do our part. And I, I completely understand the inconvenience of it because I remember the old check station days here. I, I kind of wouldn't mind to see a little revival in that. Well, so, sort of. Given the right situation, but what we ran into back in the day, um, Kentucky, you can hunt every day of the week. Mm -hmm. I think Pennsylvania, they don't allow hunting on Sunday. Yeah. Um, but in Kentucky, you could go out and hunt on a Sunday afternoon. And if you harvested a deer late in the afternoon and you didn't recover it until it got dark, well, you put that thing in the back of your pickup truck and then the search started. You had to go For find a check a, station. You had to find an open <laughs> check station. Yep. Um, where I live, there's a Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife headquarters is there. And you could go down there and, Sometimes it took a while, but the night shift guy, um, uh, if I remember right, his last name was Aldridge, Mr. Aldridge. Uh, he would come around and he would check your deer for you. And it might be 10 o'clock at night. Right. <laughs> um, but that was your option. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the thing that I miss is the social aspect of it. Oh, yeah. That, there's no telling how many bologna sandwiches that we ate at the the Peaks Mill grocery store. Yep. Um, yep. Or how many LH you drank? Or we hunted across the road at that time. We hunted in, in an area called Peaks Mill, and uh, we would go to those check stations and watch people bring their deer in. You know, uh, we bow hunted. We we never gun hunted, but uh, during the modern gun season, which I, back then I think it was two or three days. It, it wasn't very long. Yeah. But, uh, you know, you might see eight deer brought in. Yeah. You know. That was a busy day. That, that was a huge day. But, yeah. But people from all around would come to see that, you know, mm -hmm. because, you know, people, they'd seen them out in the fields maybe, but, you know, yeah. they'd never seen one up close. Or, or driving around at night. You could spotlight oh, back yeah, then. Back in, back in the day, you could certainly do that. Yeah. Uh, we never we never participated in any of that when I was growing up. Um, one of the guys that my dad hunted with asked me if I wanted to go with him one night. And my, my dad looked at me and said, well, what in the world do you want to do that for? You can't shoot them after dark. <laughs> he said, it doesn't matter if there's a hundred of them out there in the field. And I mean, he was right. <laughs> yeah. But that's just the way my dad thought. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember at my, my grandpa's check station, I lived next door to it. And I remember on weekends, I had my eyes glued out that window waiting for a truck to pull in oh yeah so that way if i, I wasn't going to miss it if there was a a deer in the bed of that truck you know, yeah. it, it was a big deal now one thing that we could talk about this stuff all night um we were talking on the way 
over here, um, just just about you know about archery bow hunting in general. Oh yeah, and love and, it, absolutely love it. Yeah, but you you shot you were a three D tournament shooter for. I I shot uh, my background when I was a I was a little bitty guy. Um, my dad and some other guys here uh, formed an archery club. So I grew up on an archery range. Yeah. Every Sunday we went to the range. And uh, as I got a little bit older, um, my dad was, at that time it was the National Field Archery Association. It was the NFAA. He actually went to some of the national tournaments. And when I got old enough to go along with him, he drug me along. And uh, just a wonderful experience to be able to go out there and do that. And, you know, and learning and and getting proficient and understanding that individual mental focus that you have to have and the competitiveness of it because it's not a team sport Mm -hmm. it's like it's like tennis you know it's you against the person on the other side of the net yeah um so developing a good mental game and and the the focus and and being able to maintain that focus and I, I think the NAS program for these kids is good mm-hmm. um, to a degree. Um, the problem that I have with NASP, and it's not a problem with it, but it, it's it's a more of a disappointment, is that millions of kids have been through this program. Mm-hmm. Where are they today? Right. Where are they at? They're not still shooting. They're not. They're not still shooting. They're not. They're not hunting. Where are they? Um, even, you know, you can, you can get a, a scholarship to go to college, to shoot in college. Mm-hmm. Um, where are they? Yeah. There, there, there's nowhere for them to go once they reach that level. Right. Right. Um, and most, most of them don't have the resources to allow them to continue on their own. The archery industry is slowly just my opinion they're pricing themselves out of the game I, yeah i would agree 100% with, with the prolification of the crossbow industry and a lot of these states allowing crossbows people are migrating away from the vertical bow the compound bow and that is cutting into their revenues because they're losing those customers yeah so I can remember back and a Jennings Fork Lightning bow. We got it at Henninger's Archery in Harrodsburg. Uh, it was $89. And my dad complained about that. <laughs> I mowed, I worked at the farm, and I fenced, and, you know, I had to pay my dad back. Yeah. But it made that bow important to me. Yeah. And, um, I went to an archery shop a few weeks ago and was in there looking at all the G whiz stuff hanging on the wall there. And I, I flipped a couple of the price tags over and, you know, after I got off the phone with my cardiologist, <laughs> I said, you know, wow, this, um, it's, it's kind of getting out of reach of the common man. Yeah. I'm, I'm still shooting a 2016 bow. Well, you know, it may even be a little older than, I bought a, I bought a bow from a friend of mine in Murray in 2011, and it was a Hoyt bow that uh, I I really liked it and it shot well. And until two weeks ago, I was still shooting that bow. Um, I liked it so well that I I went and found one at another archery shop in Central Kentucky down at uh, Sunrise Outfitters, Kurt Singer's down in Danville. Mm-hmm. And uh, Joe took care of me on that, got me going with it. And I, I, I always like to have a spare. Right. Uh, and I love to tinker. So I have, I have tinkered with those bows uh, basically for 10 years. Yeah. And uh, I had an opportunity to buy a, a new-to-me bow this year, and I, I bought one. But, uh, yeah, the sticker shock on that is it's unbelievable. <laughs> Um, 
and it, it's hard, you know, you got a, you, you take a family man, he, you know, he's got a wife and he's got a couple of kids and he's got a couple of vehicles and a house and, you know, where, where's all that extra money come from to be able to go out and spend 11, yeah. 12, $1,500 on a bow? On, in some cases, uh, just a straight up bear bow. Yeah, that's not, nothing on it. Yeah, you haven't bolted anything on it yet. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there, nowadays you're looking at $150, $200 for a, for a rest or set of sights and half yeah, dozen arrows. Yeah, I mean, you you could spend a hundred dollars on arrows pretty quick. But, but the advantage to that is you can shoot them in a target and go get them and shoot them again. Right. It's, it's not like it's not like bullets. But, yeah. Um, See, my big thing with with my bow, and like I said, it's all, I mean it's a single cam bow. Single cam bows haven't been the the in thing for several oh yeah several solo, years now. Solo cam bows they were all the rage for years because yeah. you, you know, quote unquote you don't have to time them right <laughs> right um, and that that really puts you at a huge disadvantage. Mm-hmm. Um, the the tunability of a bow is what makes them shoot right. Um, and back to that whole tinkering thing, you could you could advance your top cam. Uh, relax your bus cable a half a twist or, or put a half a twist in your bus cable and change the way the bow aimed. Yeah. Um, you, there was just so much stuff that you could do with these bows to make them shoot better. The, the problem that we have now is, and I'm not knocking archery shops, but people don't understand that when, when you go to an archery shop and you get your bow timed or tuned, um, get new strings and everything put on it. Uh, they're going to get you really, really close. But that's when the tuning starts is when you leave the shop with it and you take it home and you start shooting the bow. Yeah. There's some rest adjustments that are probably going to need to be made. You're going to need to shoot a hundred or so arrows just to settle the strings and everything and get, um, if you understand how serving works around the cams, um, they'll develop a flat spot mm-hmm. and you'll, you'll shoot that thing into where everything's really seated good. And most of the time it's within 10 shots if it's a quality string, but there's a, there's a probability there that you're probably going to need to tune that bow just a little bit more after you've shot it some, but most people leave the shop. And whatever adjustments that that bow tech made on that bow, when he handed it to you, that was the last adjustment made to it. Yep. And people go out onto the archery range and they start shooting their bow or they're shooting it in their backyard. And if there's something that's not right, chances are they don't know it. Mm -hmm. Um, They know that they shoot at 20 and then they move back to 30 yards and their arrow hits to the left. Well, the first thing they do is they adjust their sights. Yep. Well, that's not a that's not a sight problem. That's a rest problem. It could be the arrow spine. It might be too stiff or too weak, or it could be a center shot issue. And most most bow hunters they they don't know how to tune their equipment. They're they're hunters. Yeah, they're 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 meat and potato guys. And they, yeah, they they want it to be just like when you reach into the safe and get your thirty out six out to go rifle hunting. It's going to be the same this time as yeah. it was the time before yeah. that. It worked last year. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I still shoot a lot on the public archery range. We've got a local range here that um, that we go shoot at. And I'm amazed at the amount of people that will approach me and ask me, how do you do that? Mm-hmm. And, you know, they'll they'll point out their target and they've got air sprayed all over it. And mine aren't sprayed nearly as bad as theirs are. <laughs> and uh, what I teach people is you're basically just standing on the creek bank throwing rocks. You don't have a goal in mind. There's nothing that you're working on. What you're doing is you're going to the archer range and you're loading an arrow on your bow and you're drawing the bow back to full draw and you're smacking the release aid and you're discharging the bow you're just shooting. Yeah. What are you working on? What are you trying to improve on? What what part of your bow needs to be worked on? They don't even know what needs to be fixed. Yeah. Because um, they went to a box store. 
Uh, yeah. You know, and and, and, and they haven't. I, I took a picture of a bow a couple of years ago, and it was purchased at a big box store, and it had a whisker biscuit on it, and it was a right-handed bow. The whisker biscuit was mounted in the front of the riser. <laughs> now, I don't know that I believe the guy when he told me that they set it up that way, but I can't call him a liar either. So I asked him... If you don't mind, can I can I work on your bow? And he said, "Well, by all means, if you can make mine do what yours does, <laughs> I have at it." Uh, so I I fixed some issues that he had on his bow, and I took him off to the side and I said, "Do you mind if I teach you how to shoot?" And he goes, "Well, I already know how to shoot," and I said, "Do you?" And I said, "Here at twenty yards, I want you to take." three arrows and put them into one of those dots on that target. And he goes, well, I can't do that. I said, well, I thought you just told me you knew how to shoot. And he goes, I know how to shoot. Well, then why can't you put three arrows into that dot? And that was part of him not understanding. You know, he just didn't know. It's not that he's dumb or ignorant or anything like that. He really just didn't know. Mm -hmm. But he'd been standing up there shooting his bow for 30 minutes. So I worked with him a little bit and I told him, you know, in order to be able to do what I do, you have to develop a shot process. And it's something that you do the exact same way every time that you shoot your bow. You can't deviate from it. And it doesn't have to be like everybody else does it. No, it has to be repeatable. Mm -hmm. So what I do with people um, is... I teach them how to focus. Most people don't know how to aim their bow. Now that, that sounds kind of crazy, but people don't know how to aim. They don't know what to focus on or how to focus on things. So what I do to people is I get them over there and I get them at full draw. And I start talking them through the process of looking through their peep sight and looking past their sight pins at their intended target. So if we're at 20 yards... I want them to focus on the target and I want them to see their sight pin in their line of sight. So you're not focused on the sight pin because the sight pin in most cases is 33 inches in front of your eye. What is your expectation to hit something 20 yards away if you're focused on something that's 33 inches in front of your eye? Yeah. So you have to allow your subconscious mind to correct everything for you. And... And part of that process is if I tell you to pick up a rock and throw it and, and hit a, 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 a tree out in the yard, but don't look at the tree, pretty high likelihood that you're going to throw the rock wherever you're looking. Mm -hmm. Probably not going to hit the tree. And that's why I say it's like standing on a creek bank throwing rocks. You're just throwing them in the creek. Yeah. So... You start applying to their logic a little bit and, and teach them those little small things about how to aim their bow. And then what I'll do during that process is I'll tell them, don't put your finger on the trigger. And I will divert their attention to aiming the bow. And then while they're aiming the bow, I'll reach over there and I'll trip their trigger. <laughs> scares them to death. I was going to say, you give them a heart attack. It it's absolutely scares them to death. But what's really strange is that Five times out of ten, they don't know that they didn't pull the trigger. So I immediately get another arrow, get that thing loaded up. Let's go. Come on. We're going to aim some more. And I get them right back into it, and I, I'm channeling their focus away from that trigger on that release. And I get out there and, and get them going through that entire process again, centering the peep. Focus on the target, see your pin in your line of sight, and when I get them like they need to be, you can look at that bow and that thing is rock steady. It's not moving. They're focused. Mm -hmm. I trip their trigger. And it's right back to grab another arrow, let's go. And we'll do that three times, and I tell them, go pull your arrows out of the target and tell me where they're at. They're usually... They may not be in the spot because they probably weren't aiming correctly to begin with, 
But what they will be is the size of a baseball. Three arrows. Which yeah. is something that they've never done in their lives. And now they're like, well, I didn't know I could do that. Well, sure you can do it. You just need to know how to do it. Mm-hmm. So that's how I get them started down the path of developing a shot sequence. And why that's important is we were teasing earlier about minute of deer accuracy. Here's what happens in most bow hunters' minds when they commit to shooting a deer. That's when the fangs come out, and that's when the eyes turn red, and the the slobber starts. You go into full-blown kill mode. You have spent anywhere from thirty to sixty thousand dollars on a pickup truck. You've got a fifteen thousand dollar four wheeler or side by side that you've drug all over the country behind this thing. You've paid countless thousands of dollars for this lease. You've poured God knows how much money and corn out on the ground, but one thing you haven't done is you haven't learned how to shoot your bow. Why do we do that? Yeah. We'll spend a billion dollars deer hunting. We never learn how to shoot the bow. Yeah. So that that's the the one split second that actually matters. So that split second is when it matters. If you talk to any tournament archer, they can go out and they can shoot their bow all day long and there's never a problem. You tell him he's four points out of the lead. Pressure. That's when they fail. Mm-hmm. The difference in the Danny McCarthy's and the Levi Morgan's and those guys is they can channel their emotions and they don't allow themselves to be affected by the pressure. That's why they win. Yeah. If you take a guy that's inexperienced and put him in that same situation, he's probably not going to be able to deal with that pressure. But what enables them to be able to do that is they have a process. It's it's those steps that they go through every time they draw the bow back. And you can get on YouTube and you can pick out any professional archer and you can watch and you watch Danny McCarthy draw his bow. Uh, watch Jack Wallace. I, I was when you said that one of the things that immediately came to mind for me um, was watching the Olympic archery. Unbelievable, tournaments. especially the recurve shooters. Yeah, you you watch these guys, and if you if you pay attention, you can you can visually see them going through each step of their process. Well, here's what happens to. Average Joe bow hunter is he's that guy that goes out there and he shoots 20 arrows on the practice bags and he's not working on anything. He's just shooting his bow. He's throwing rocks in the creek. So you get out there and you get in a situation where you make that mental commitment to, I'm going to try to harvest this animal, buck, doe, whatever it is that you're going to shoot. Mm -hmm. They, they get ready. They draw the bow, maybe to anchor, Maybe not to anchor. <laughs> and as soon as they see hair in their sight picture, that shot's gone. Yep. It is. That, that, and if, if, you, if you talk to those people and you get into their mind a little bit and, and ask them what process they went through to get to that point, they have no idea because there's no process in place. So when I teach people how to shoot targets... What I try to do is ingrain a shot process in there. When I see a deer in the woods, if I make a commitment, I'm going to try to shoot this deer. Once I've made the choice, I immediately start breaking that deer down. I'm looking for a tuft of hair that's sticking out. I'm looking for a piece of dirt. Um, I'm looking for a shadow. I'm looking for a, a, a little bit of muscle definition. I'm looking for something that I can focus on on the deer. I'm not aiming at the deer. You're looking at something to shoot at that's on what you're wanting to shoot. I'm looking at a, I'm trying to find a spot to aim at. Mm -hmm. And what that keeps me from doing is shooting at the deer. And that's what a lot of hunters do. If you spend a lot of time talking to deer hunters, you say, hey, you know, um, what happened? Why shot high? Well, the first thing they say is the deer jumped stream. 
Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. Deer don't jump. They do go down. So when you jump on the string is kind of a a bad uh, they 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 fall. They're dropping, yeah. Um, and that accounts for some high shots. But most bow hunters, they come from the top down. So they draw the bow back, and as soon as they get the pin wobbled down onto the deer somewhere, they shoot. If they hit the deer, they hit the deer high. But you ask them, where'd you hit it? Well, I think I hit high. Because they don't know, because they weren't looking at a spot. They weren't, they didn't pick out a spot to aim. Yeah. And that's, that's another part of the, the process that I teach, is learning why you miss. Is when you develop a shot process... You draw the bow back to anchor and you execute the shot. You don't make the shot happen. You let the shot happen. And you can do it with an index finger release. You can do it with a back tension. You can do it with a thumb button. You don't command that shot. You let it happen. Unless you're Tim Gillingham. And he's a trigger puncher from way back. But uh, even he will tell you that there's times when that's not going to work. Yeah. And he's very successful. But understanding why you miss so you can stand out there and you can shoot five arrows at a target and four of them are right there where they need to be and one of them's not do you know why and they don't so they go draw the arrows out and they go back and they do it again and they keep doing it again keep doing it again keep doing it and they never know why Mm -hmm. so it 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 could be little small things like grip pressure in the bow you know you may have a little more heel in it and that accounts for that high arrow or it may be a situation where you're collapsing in your shot. You're not pulling through the shot. You're not executing good tension in the back. And I'm not advocating that everybody be at a level where they could be a target archer. I'm just saying that people need to learn the proper way to shoot their bow. And that $60,000 pickup truck with that $15,000 buggy on the back of it, all of a sudden those are going to start paying dividends for you because you're going to go out and start killing deer. Yeah. Uh, and it gets rid of that minute of deer accuracy mentality. It, it's helpful. Uh, there, there's nothing wrong with learning how to shoot your bow correctly. Um, and it, it's... Admittedly, I used to laugh at people that couldn't shoot. It, it was comical to me. Not that they were struggling. is that the amount of effort they put into everything except shooting their bow. Yeah. And then I made a conscious decision one day that, hey, you know, you're part of the problem. If you don't offer to help these people, um, in the big grand scheme of things, social media being what social media is, people get on there and they go, hey, I wounded a deer and it ran off and I can't find it. Uh, Just a few short years ago, if you were that guy and you got on social media and you say you wounded a deer, you got blistered. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. You got mean-mouthed, you got chastised. Uh, It was awful. Um, So that that tells people, hey, I can't get on here and ask for help. Yeah. So that kind of shuts people down. Well, then they they started with tracking dogs. Well, now you get on there and and you're that same guy. Hey, I wounded a deer. Find a dog. Find a dog. I was was looking at a few of those on Facebook Mm -hmm. today. Yeah, uh, a friend of ours um, last night shot a deer and wounded it, and he he chalked it up and he said, "Hey, you know, it, it's just wounded and it's run off." Well, aren't you going to go look for it? Well, I looked for it last night. Well, aren't you going to go look for it today? Well, I looked for it last night. Well, go look for it today. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, but uh, understanding why we miss. And how we miss um, helps you eliminate that problem. Mm-hmm. And most bow hunters, they don't ever progress to that point. And um, I get a lot of personal satisfaction in going to an archery range and, and seeing that guy that's struggling. Uh, sometimes I offer help. Sometimes, uh, sometimes they ask for help. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they don't want help. Yeah. And, uh, it's unfortunate, you know, but you know, you grow up and, and 
um, you have mentors. And, uh, you know, there's so many myths out there with deer hunting and, and so many, uh, you know, things that your dad always said that, you know, later in life you find out, well, that really doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Um, if, if Uncle Bob's the guy teaching you how to shoot your bow, and, you know, he, he's got your draw length way too long and, and got a hair trigger on your release aid. And uh, it's okay to shoot a bent broadhead. And you don't have to sharpen that. And, you know. Uh, it's good a, enough. Yeah. And that <laughs> and that, that's something else. Uh, sharp broadheads. I Again, I'm a tinker. And I, God knows you've probably read enough of the stuff that I've, some of it probably makes sense. Some of it probably doesn't. And I, I, I get it. But uh, I can remember when if you bought a package of broadheads and you got them out of the package, there was a pretty high likelihood you were going to bleed. Yeah. You were going to cut yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, either I've gotten smarter or the broadheads have gotten dull. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure it's the latter. Um, broadheads just aren't razor sharp like they used to be. And that... that that's mechanical. That's that's a replaceable blade. Um, you start getting into some of the higher quality single bevel, double bevel broadheads. Those those are sharp. Mm-hmm. Um, but people have this attitude of you know if I take it out of the package and it's brand new, it's sharp enough. And that's not always the case. They they should. I'm one of those people that think that if you take a broadhead out of the package, it should be sharp enough. I think if I pay the kind of money that they're charging for those things, absolutely, that, that it shouldn't require any maintenance. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's just not the case. And I shoot replaceable blade broadheads. Um, over the years, I've learned some hard lessons. I, uh, I shot a deer with a uh, a broadhead that had an aluminum ferrule. And the broadhead entered into the deer through the rib cage and hit the offside shoulder. And the, the broadhead ferrule itself actually just shattered, crumbled, mm-hmm. uh, not bent. I mean, like five pieces is what I salvaged out of Shrapnel. that shoulder. Yes. And in my mind, that's a failure. Mm-hmm. It was a dead deer. I got the end result. But what would have happened if I would have hit the onside shoulder? Right. That's a wounded animal. Um, and our all of us, our goal should be to never wound one. But if you shoot enough of them, you're going to have something bad happen. Sooner, yeah, sooner or later. Uh, there are those that have and there are those that will. And, uh, you know, th- there are guys that you can talk to that have had great success that have never wounded a deer. God love them. You know, you're doing it right. Or you're lucky. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's guys that you talk to them. It's like, hey, I wounded four last year. Yeah. You know, that guy, he, he's struggling. Uh, but I, I started tinkering with sharpening broadheads a couple of years ago. Um, I got invited to hunt a farm um, down in Logan County. And I, I did something really dumb on my part. Um the day before I left, a friend of mine showed up with a Ziploc bag full of broadheads and said, Hey, I don't shoot these anymore, <laughs> but I know that you do. And I said, Hey, great. And he said, Three of them have been shot and three of them are brand new. Well, I needed a broadhead. So I reached in the bag and I looked at it. I didn't check it. I looked at it. Thinking back, uh, the guy that gave these things to me is a, uh, he's very clean. <laughs> he had actually cleaned the broadheads up. So the residue from the target wasn't so on the target. you couldn't tell, yeah. Couldn't tell by looking. Um, and just last week, I, I, I communicated with you guys about cutting my thumb. I had a broadhead that I had probably shot a hundred times into a practice target. I cut myself with it. Yeah, I mean, it's dull. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I go down there and I hunt this guy's farm. And the deer comes out and I, I pinwheel it. Just that perfect shot that everybody talks about. And he is a very experienced hunter. And he and I went out and 
Um, because of the stand placement, there was a cedar tree, and I shot the deer, and it immediately wheeled back the direction it came from, so I lost sight of it. I'm hard of hearing. Wear hearing protection if you're going to fire firearms, folks. Um, I didn't hear the deer crash. I couldn't hear a 747 crash. So, uh, anyway, we didn't find blood. And uh, he had enough confidence in me to, to believe me when I told him, hey, I made a really good shot on this deer. So we look, and we looked at all the obvious routes that the deer could have taken. We knew that it wasn't going to stay in the field. It was right in the field edge. We knew that once the deer was shot, it, it was going back into the timber. Yeah. And we grid searched. Uh, I walked within 15 yards of the deer the night before. Uh, didn't see it. Um, went back the next day in the daylight, stepped into the wood line, and 60 yards away is the deer laying there. Yeah. So what did I do wrong? I shot the deer with a dull broadhead, and the deer, the last 15 yards, bled. And I was like, what in the world is going on here? You know, I took pictures of it, and I sent it to him, and I said, I don't understand. And then that's when the light came on. I wonder if that's one of those broadheads that I got out of that bag. So I go back, and I check my quiver, and sure enough, um, uh, I, I shot, and there's no telling how many times he'd shot it practicing with it. Yeah. Um, so it was a lesson learned, you know, check check every time. Yeah. Well, and, and several companies advertise, you know, you can shoot your broadheads in their air targets. They're still going to be sharp. You use a tool, it is going to wear down. Yes. I don't care what it is. And I have at home... Uh, on my workbench, a little square piece of uh, foam, styrofoam. Mm -hmm. My practice broadheads get stuck in there. That's where I leave them. You've got a system. So that way I know. Yeah, you're smarter than I am. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's pretty evident. Uh, I throw mine, um, and my friends make fun of me that know me that come to my house. I have a tackle box, and it is full of uh this isn't a product endorsement or anything but i shoot slick trick broadheads <laughs> and i shoot a lot of them uh i give them away to people that want to practice with them yeah and uh i've probably still got 30 or 40 of them in that box <laughs> and uh I got to beating around on youtube one day and i found this guy uh innovative outdoorsman and he's, he's got a sharpener. And I was like, hey, I've got a bunch of broadheads I could sharpen. Because I had tried several ways to sharpen those things. I tried Lanskys and the Smiths and all those things. To, yeah. Um, never could get them quite right. So I was like, you know, 30 bucks, I'm going to order one of these sharpeners that this guy's got. The Stay Sharp system. Uh, it's a game changer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, absolutely insane how sharp you can get these broadheads yeah uh, to the point that you, you put on leather gloves and then you start handling them right right um and I've, I've since shot several deer with those things and um the blood trails are back you know they're you're getting a good foamy they're, they're what you want yeah i mean it's the ray charles blood trail <laughs> right know, uh so there's there's a lot of things and and if you enjoy tinkering, archery is a great sport. I love it to to tinker. Um, I know you you did a podcast with the Ranch Fairy not long ago. Yeah, and uh, he he is a first class grade A tinkerer. Yes, he loves it. Uh, he and I could get together and and do some some real live tinkering and <laughs> and both because. Uh, I today I got home and I cut all the veins off my arrows, <laughs> uh, five of my arrows, and I found some old Arizona veins in a box out in my garage. And they're they're four inch veins, so I glue four of these on to, to each one of my arrows, and I went to the practice range and I shot them, and uh, 
I, I sent a text message to my friend. I said, I had forgotten just how primitive these things were because <laughs> they're, they're terrible. But 15 years ago, 18 years ago, that was the best you could buy. Yeah. Um, but I, I fletched five arrows and I put four fletch uh, veins on there. And I went out and I, uh, I didn't even shoot 20 and 30. I went straight to the 40 yard bag and I shot five arrows into the target. And when I went to retrieve them, I had three that were shootable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I shot the, there's holes, rips, and tears, and those veins are just not durable. Yeah. But they shot well. But uh, it, it, back then, that's what you hunted with. Mm-hmm. I, I wouldn't hunt with them now, but. Right. Right. But it was an opportunity to tinker, so. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Everyday Outdoorsman. It's listeners like you that help keep this podcast going and keep it improving. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast and like us on Facebook to keep up with the latest episodes. And until next time, we'll see you later.